here about it. I'd like to call no one will need a list from county commissioners to order. Mr. Evan Station instruction, please. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Good evening to everyone. I'd like to invite Ms. Natalie Beth, our deputy county manager, to come up and give us our safety instruction. Good evening. Good evening. To provide for the safety of those attending this meeting, please listen to the following instructions in case of an emergency. First, please take a moment to note where your exits are. If an emergency arises that prompts us to evacuate, I ask that everyone exit this room in a quick and orderly manner through one of the two exterior doors, one to your right, to your right. Once you exit the building, we ask that you safely cross Granville Street to our parking lot to be safely away from the building. Our staff will provide additional direction and assistance. In the case of a tornado warning, we ask that you exit this room into the hallway where we will all remain until it is safe to exit. In the event of an active shooter, we ask that you run if there is an accessible escape path and try to evacuate the premises, hide if you can't evacuate, and find a place to hide where you are less likely to be found and lock any doors that you can, and finally, as a last resort, fight, and only if your life is in imminent danger. Our staff will continue to provide additional direction and assistance on what to do. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Eternal God, our Father, we give thanks for this day. We thank you for your life that you've given us. We ask that you bless us to be sensible to the needs of our community. Help us to make the right decisions that makes our county a better place in which to live. Through Christ our Lord, we do pray. Amen. Do you have any agenda package to mention from the previous meeting? If you have no additional corrections, no motion. I shall move. Question? All in favor, let me know by the vote sign aye. 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 All opposed? There is none. And that's all. Thank you. The next agenda item a public hearing is called to order the to the entry of block grants, neighborhood revitalization application. The public hearing is called to order. Mr. Peters, would you please read the public notice? Yes, sir. On November 6, 2023, at 7 p.m., in the Jonathan Tuff Commission's room in the Edgecombe County Administrative Building, the Edgecombe County Board of Commissioners will conduct a public hearing to receive comments on proposed application for CDBG and our funding for housing improvements within Edgecombe County. The county intends to request $950,000 to rehabilitate slash reconstruct owner-occupied low to moderate income homes. The public is invited to provide comments. The county will respond to all written comments within 10 calendar days encourages comments and will make good faith efforts to involve historically underutilized businesses and Section 3 individuals and businesses in execution of the program. Persons with disabilities or who are otherwise need assistance should contact the person listed below at least one day in advance of the hearing. Accommodation will be made for all who request assistance with participating in the public hearing. If this information is available in Spanish or any other language upon request, please contact the individual listed below to accommodate this request. Mr. Evans, comments? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. We have a representative here tonight from McDavid and Associates who's working with Ms. Braswell and I and her team on preparing this application. So I'll ask him to come forward. He's going to give an overview of the application we're going to submit. Uh, while he's coming, I'll let you know that there will be two actions we'll ask that you take tonight. The first being to approve a citizen's participation plan, which a copy of that is at your place. Um, you've seen this before. Uh, it talks about the ways that we will inform our citizens about this program, which includes the public hearing that we're having tonight. Um, also, pending any public comment and your questions, I ask that you will, uh, in separate action, adopt the resolution that's presented as well that will authorize us to uh, submit this application. Evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Adrian Mandigo. Work with McDavid Associates. Um, like they said, that Edgecombe County will be applying for a $950,000 grant. That will be aimed to assist LMI homeowners. That's gonna, the housing committee was, uh, was collected together and met and ranked the eligible applicants. The beneficiaries that were that were selected was from a total of 136 applicants that the top six were ranked, and that was based upon a reconstruction level of assistance that would be needed to the homes. So there was the top six there. And then the the plan is projected to have four homes reconstructed 
and two more to ha have as standby units in case if there was any issues with the top four being able to receive assistance. And then that I would ask that we would be able to approve the citizens participation, participation plan and to approve the, the resolution. I can read the resolution if needed. Do this Yes. So the city of, I mean, Edgecombe County has has homeowners that call in, and they have kept a, a good record for over the last two years. And um, those are normally aimed at the urgent repair program Edgecombe County has done in the past, I believe it was the Wooten Company. And um, so then we we did a, a very brief evaluation on the houses there, but also being able to see houses that have substantial needs of, of repair, high to, highlighted those sections, highlighted those houses to be able to be for further review. And then from there, we did a secondary inspection internally in the houses, and that allowed us to be able to, to present our findings to the housing selection committee from there. And so with internal and exterior photos of the house, that allowed us to, to select the top six. Uh, no, as, as he mentioned, uh, you know, Ms. Braswell, her, her staff get calls all the time, people interested in programs like this. Unfortunately, we never get enough funds to address all the needs that we see. Um, you may recall at your previous meeting, um, you saw a uh, from the selection committee the criteria, and there were things like giving priority to uh, elderly applicants, priority to uh, very low income, have to be low income, but gave priority to very low income um, households. And also, as he mentioned, it was based on the needs of the homes itself, that based on the inspection. <coughs> Do we try to make sure that we don't put all the money in one area that's got kind of spread it out throughout the county and not have all of it done in one particular area? Yes, yeah, a good question. In fact, one, one of the criteria for the selection committee was to try to, um, was based on geographic distribution. So I think you'll see uh, if the application is approved, approved that it is uh, it is a good spread across, not just all in Tarboro and Canita, there's a pretty good spread. Yes, the, the cities that I've listed is Battleboro, Tarboro, uh, Macclesfield, and Rocky Mountain. Sorry if I mispronounced. Another comment or question? So there are four homes that we expect to be able to reconstruct. The other two are alternates in case, for one, whatever reason, one of those four fall out of the process. The other two are alternates. So you're reconstructing four homes with $950,000? Yes. $237,000. Yeah. Uh, I'm And that's, that's what this is. So most of these homes are homes that are beyond repair. As you can imagine, of the applicants that we get, some need minor repair, some need substantial rehab, and we refer to it. Some are beyond rehabilitation. That is, the cost to rehabilitate it is, is beyond a certain value threshold of the home. So also part of that um, administrative cost um, and things like that, cost to have it inspected or the construction monitor relocation assistance during the time frame that the homeowners are displaced is, is a lump sum that starts to be able to help re relocate themselves and their items and then the monthly fees that come in with that during the demolition process and reconstruction process of house so that has to be accounted for are you, are you saying you, you have to sometimes demolish a house yes, yes. You know, the, the, the goal of these programs, and this is a delicate balance, is to try to address the most severe housing conditions out there. And in that, oftentimes you'll find homes that you, you could spend $40,000 doing renovations and it still have significant needs, so you just can't address all of the needs. 
And so in that case, this program and other programs we've worked with before does allow for, they call it reconstruction, but it's basically tearing down and building building a new home. Do they have to pay more? No, sir. There, there is a deed restrictions on the home. There's a lien on the house that they can't sell it for a certain period of time. Amount is forgiven over that period of time. If they sell it within that window of time, they have to pay back all or a portion of the amount that was spent. So do the finishers already know who was killed them, or they haven't released that information? We haven't released that yet. That we first have to apply for these funds. That they oh, okay. As as part of the um, application to the state, the homeowners will have to sign agreeing that they want to proceed with the with the program as intended. So, yes. No, sir. So does the committee decide that There's, if you don't mind, there's a 70, so with the with the program, with the state, we've been monitored a few times on there, and they look at it at about $70,000 per square, I mean $70 per square foot, but if you exceed over $72,000 to repairs to the house, that's when they start looking at why, why wasn't this originally suggested to be a reconstruction. And this is one of the few programs that does allow us to be able to do that to one household with a fairly reasonable amount of time for given loan time with the deed of trust to secure that. But um, the program idea is to be able to, to have that homeowner receive that type of level of assistance and also for them to be able to, to stay in that home indefinitely after. What happens to that home should it be for an elderly person who has it? So the deed would travel directly to the next line of air. The only the only time that there would be any type of recruitment process would be if the deed changed monetarily. So as long as as long as there was no monetary transaction, then there would be no need to um, have any repayment of that loan. So the heirs can own it as long as they don't sell. Yes. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, none of the motion to the motion to the public. Public, excuse me, I'm sorry. Is there anybody from the public that would like to hear this? Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. I'm the Reverend Roosevelt Haig, historic of State, North Carolina, and I don't know whether it's Evelyn District of Commissioner Harris. But there's a situation that going on down in Speed, North Carolina, that I would like, I don't want to call the family's name, but I will talk with the manager about that tomorrow. I would hope that if there's any way that some of that money could be used to address that family, they were living in the house and do mishap, they moved out of the house, and as I understand, they may be living down in Canada now in a substandard house. But to me, the situation should have been detected. They got a house built uh, out of a group out of Chapel Hill after the flood of 99 to miss out with some taxes. Somehow the house got from under them and they're supposed to start paying rent and the people that built the house out of Chapel Hill, I understand they came back down and got that somewhat cleared up or they didn't think it was fair for someone to be paying rent for a house that they built and gave to them. But the family is mentally challenged, and I just feel like there ought to be a some way where people know everything else about people. If they know that a family is mentally challenged, and this family has a handicapped child that's in the household as well, so it's re it real bad when you know this at the community level, but it probably happened more often than what we realize, and I'd be more than happy to talk to the manager. You may be familiar with it already. Okay. Right. I do ask y'all to every dollar you can get. Is there anybody else? Good morning, good evening, everybody. 
Uh, I hear that there's going to be a, a modification to the, uh, what do you call it, uh, getting uh, documents. Oh, oh, public records requests. Right. I, I would suggest to save money for the county that you also, I didn't see it in the document that you proposed, that you add that you can send out PDFs instead of paper copies. And, that, and that's another item on the agenda, but so noted. Yes, sir. Okay. That's, I just wanted to know, it, you know, it's going to be later on, so I wouldn't be able to speak, so I wish okay. I could. You think you'd still be able to speak. This is not the, this is not the, uh, this is not the public view here. This is just the public view. This is just the public view. You know, just right. See, anybody's here to speak? There is none. There is none. Uh, the request is a motion. Citizen State, Citizen State Bank. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Recommend that you approve. Can we get a motion on the Citizen State Bank? Motion to approve. Second. Question. All in favor, let me know by the roadside. Aye. Aye. All opposed? Hearing none, the Citizen State Bank is approved. The date? Is it resolution? Is the motion on resolution correct? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Recommend that you approve. We have it for you. We need a motion. Second. Questions? All in favor, let me know how to vote. Aye. Aye. All opposed? Hearing none, the resolution is approved. At this time, if all action taken, I'd like to adjourn the public hearing. The date item on the agenda is a public hearing is called to order for the city of Southern Thomas Brothers to a special use permit request from Barnville Contractors, something for property located on Ennis. Uh, this is a quasi judicial hearing. Mr. Peters, would you please read the public notice? Yes, sir. The public notice is hereby given that a public hearing will be held by the Board of Commissioners of Edgecombe County on Monday, November 6, 2023, at 7 p.m. in the Jonathan Felton Commissioner's, Commissioner's Room, second floor, County Administrative Building, 201 St. Andrew Street, Harbor, North Carolina, to consider a special use permit request submitted by Barnhill Contracting Company for excavation of sand, clay, and other earthen materials. The property is located on NC 33 Northwest near Ellis Lane, Harvard, North Carolina. Also identified as parcel number 48200463020. Copies of the proposed sand mine are available for public inspection during business hours 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. in the County Planning Office room 205 County Administrative Building, 219 <coughs> Andrew Street, Harvard, North Carolina. All parties in interest and all interested residents are invited to be present to make their views known. This is the 25th day of October 2023, by order of the Board of Commissioners of Edgecombe County, by Frank D. Mungo, Clerk of the Board. Is that his commencement? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. As, as was just mentioned by Mr. Peters, this is a, an application for a special use permit for the expansion of an existing uh, sand pit. Um, there is a uh, staff report summary in your packet that we uh, submit that for the record tonight. Um, I do want to highlight, as you see in your packet, um, that your options for action tonight are the following. You can choose to either approve the special use and con concept plan as presented, or number two, you can approve a revised special use and concept plan. Or a third option is to deny the special use and concept plan. As Mr. Peter, Peter mentioned, this is a, a quasi-judicial hearing, and therefore anyone who speaks tonight will have to be sworn in. I do believe that we have here with us tonight a representative from uh, Barnhill Construction. Also, Ms. Katina Braswell, our planning director, will be sworn in as well, just in case she's had <coughs> questions by you. If there's anybody here participating in this public hearing, would you please come forward and be sworn? In order to speak tonight, you have to be sworn. If you'll place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right. Do you swear or affirm that the evidence you shall give to the board in this action shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Thank you. Is there anybody else to be sworn? If you decide you want to come at me. After this, we will pray. At this time, I guess we'll ask for comments. Comments can be from the applicant. 
Uh, good evening, uh, commissioners. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to be here. My name is Jonathan Proctor. Um, I'm with Barn Hill Contracting Company. Um, and on behalf of Barn Hill, I appreciate you taking the time to um, listen to our uh, case for the special use permit. Um, this is a piece of property that we've been on just north of um, for the last 15, 16 years. Um, we are currently mining out towards <coughs> NC33 and getting to a place where we're going to need to expand our operation. Um, this pit, just a little background, this pit um, supplies pretty much exclusively our asphalt plant in Rocky Mount. So this sand goes directly into the production of our asphalt. Um, all the asphalt is made in Rocky Mount. Um, so we are looking to expand it just to get some more, um, get the next in line material um, to make some more asphalt. Um, you know, obviously there's a particular type of material we've got to use. Um, it's not in, in every location. We've got to kind of hunt and pick where we can find it. Um, so this obviously with us being right there um, where we are, um, made sense for us to expand. Um, just south of, of the piece of part of property that we're actually looking at tonight, um, we already own um, and have an existing conditional use permit on it as well um, that we got back in 2007-8 range. Um, so this will just, just allow us to continuously mine in the same area that we've already been. Um, we have already submitted our application for the mining permit with the state that will regulate all of the erosion control, dust control, um, buffers, um, in addition to the um, 100 foot property line buffer that we'll have to abide by with the county ordinance. Um, all, of, all of the wetland environmental concerns would be addressed in that uh, permit that we received from the state. So. Um, it's, it's in review. I've actually already gotten comments back, and I hope to have the, um, the permit by before the end of the month. I'll be glad to answer any questions if you have any. Questions from the board? Question. Go ahead. Uh, we've received a technical review committee comment. Uh, have we looked at the board action that was already approved in the last meeting? Um, it's on so um, in, the, in the actual area of the pit, there, there obviously are none. It's, a, it's an existing just agricultural field. Um, with the application that we have for permitting, we have to identify any wells within 1,500 feet. If we find any, we have to survey them, and then there's a monitoring, and there's actually we have a, we have a deep water and permit um, that uh, we have to um, submit data to and all so we can monitor make sure there's no drawdown or anything like that. Um, in this particular site, any water that we do pump, we pump internally back into the same pit that we've already um, excavated, so there's not a lot of, of, of pumping and then discharge off-site. Everything is kept on-site. Yeah. So. Yeah, I have a question for Thank you. Thank you. Question. All in favor, let me know my first time. Aye. Aye. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so I'd like to invite Ms. Sherry Johnson, our veteran services uh, director. As she's coming, you'll, you'll recognize there's a, a lamp uh, with a green bulb in it just behind you. The front of our building is lit up green. And Ms. Sherry Johnson, our veteran service director, is going to read a resolution that will explain why we're here. Good evening. <coughs> Good evening. Whereas the residents of Edgecombe County have great respect, admiration, and utmost gratitude for all the men and women who have selflessly served our country and this community in the armed forces, and whereas the contributions and sacrifices of men and women who served in the armed forces have been vital in maintaining the freedom and way of life enjoyed by our citizens, and whereas the Edgecombe County seeks to honor those individuals who have paid a high price for freedom by placing themselves in harm's way for good of all, and whereas the veterans continue to serve our community in American Legion, veterans of foreign affairs, religious groups, civil services, and by functioning as county veteran service officers in 29 states to help former fellow former service members across the across more than access more than $52 billion in federal health, disability, and compensation benefits each year. Whereas approximately 200,000 service members transition to civilian communities annually, and whereas an estimated 20% increase of service members will transition to civilian life in the near future, and whereas studies indicate that 44 to 72% of service members experience high levels of stress during transition from the military to civilian life. And whereas military service members transition from military service or at a high risk for suicide during the first year after military service, and whereas the National Association of Counties encourages all counties, parishes, and boroughs to recognize Operation Green Lights for its veterans, whereas the Edgecombe County Board of Commissioners appreciates the sacrifices of our United States military personnel to least specific recognition should be granted. And the veterans in the audience, you can please thank them. This is just our way of saying thank you for your service. Thank you so much for the service that you have. Most of the group are All in favor, let's say aye. 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 All opposed. Thank you so much. Next, Mr. Chairman, is uh, Ms. Betty Battle. Our DSS director is here tonight to give you an update on Medicaid expansion that's about to start. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Betty Battle, and I'm the Social Services Director for Edgecombe County. And um, I'm going to be, I have a presentation, there it is, it just popped up, that I'm going to be covering about Medicaid expansion. <clears throat> I also have with me our family and the Medicaid supervisor, Tina Radford. She's here to answer any policy questions that might come up about Medicaid expansion. So as we know, um, Medicaid expansion, effective December the 1st, 2023, will be here in North Carolina. And right now for Edgecombe County, the state is um, projected that we're going to have about 3,177 citizens that will be eligible for Medicaid expansion. And they're also projecting that about 22,000, no, 2,200 people who are um, what they call um, family planning waiver eligible. Those are people that are eligible for family planning waiver, but they don't receive Medicaid. In fact, that December the 1st, they will automatically roll over and begin receiving uh, Medicaid as well. So you're talking about close to 50, about 5,400 people that we can um, expect to be eligible for Medicaid come December the 1st. <coughs> right now, what Edgecombe County has received and um, the amount of funds that Edgecombe County has received for <coughs> Medicaid expansion that we have to have spent by June, June the 30th, 2024, is $261,367. And so they laid out some criteria that we can use for spending the money, which includes hiring additional staff, paying for overtime, um, hiring bonuses, um, um, 
purchasing equipment, improving technology. Those are some of just some of the things that we can use to spend this money. After June 30th to 2024, they are supposed to continue to fund this. Even if they do not, counties will still be able to claim reimbursement at the 75-25. And you all, pretty, I, hope, I guess you all know what that means. That, all right, so for all of our Medicaid positions that we have in the agency, the state pays 75% of the cost. Edgecombe County pays 25% that we claim reimbursement for on the 1571. So for all of our positions, the state fund pretty much the positions. Um, even if they do not continue with the Medicaid expansion dollars, we will still continue to do the 75-25. And that's for every Medicaid positions and for our food and nutrition positions is 50%. Um, people that are eligible for Medicaid expansion will be able to visit the doctor um, for inpatient, outpatient care, uh, emergency health care, mental health, behavioral health, all of those services will be covered through Medicaid expansions. Uh, right now, our behavioral health provider is um, East Point. However, um, they are in the process of merging with, um, consolidating with Trillium and Trillium will be taking them over. And at that time, then our behavioral health provider will be Trillium. <coughs> Maternity and postpartum care, <coughs> primary care in prescription drug benefits, they will be able to pay for prescriptions. The maximum cost that it would be for them would be $4. Um, these are the income limits for people who will be eligible if you're between the ages of 19 through 64 and your income is 138% of the federal poverty level. Then if you're a single adult, and you, you're a family or household size of one, then uh, if your annual income is equal to or less than 20,120, then you would be eligible for Medicaid expansion. Family of two is 27,214, and I won't go all the way down, but you can see the household in the income limits that is listed for each household. If you are already eligible for Medicaid, you still are. There will be no changes. <clears throat> uh, Non-citizens would be uh, maybe eligible for Medicaid if they are, they are not eligible for full Medicaid, meaning if they don't have all the required documents, they may be eligible for some form of Medicaid. Like if they have to go to the emergency room, then they may be able to receive Medicaid for those purposes. But unless they are um, fully documented. Um, there's going to be some restrictions on the Medicaid. Okay. It's not going on to the right. Okay, you want to quit? <laughs> How much does Medicaid cost? Zero. You do not have to pay any monthly premiums for Medicaid. Uh, the highest copay, as I mentioned earlier, is four dollars and is only required on for some services. So the information that you would need to apply for Medicaid is pretty much what's listed there. You you would have to have your full name, your date of birth, your social security number, or if you're an immigrant, then you would need your immigration documents proof of your, um, that you're a resident of North Carolina, um, and income information that you can get from your pay stubs, your W-2, or tax returns. We do verify that information when it's submitted, so um, we put that information out there just so people know that we do verify all information that's provided. How do you apply for Medicaid? You can do it in four different ways. You can do it through ePass, which is online through edgecombecountync.gov or ncdhhs.gov. Either way, you can go and apply for the Medicaid um, through ePass. You can get an application by visiting our office and or calling our office and we will mail you or give to you a paper application. How long does it take after you apply? It may take up to 45 days. It just depends on if you provided everything that's needed for your application to be processed. And you see 45? Yes, sir. And that's um, if 
you provided everything that we need. If you didn't answer all of the questions or all of the information must be provided, then it could take longer because that, then we would have to reach back out to you, ask you for that information, receive it from you, and process your application. So that would extend the process somewhat. When can citizens apply? They can apply now. And can I call Tina up to talk about that? Yes, because I'm, I'm going to open this up to the public too. Okay. So Tina's going. Go okay, so Tina's going to speak about the um, family planning waiver, and if you apply now, how that affects your application. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tina Ratford. Um, family and Children Medicaid Supervisor. Um, in order, if you apply today or tomorrow or online, if you would apply today, your application date would be November the 6th or November the 7th. Um, so therefore, if you were approved, you would get family planning program. You would get your family planning for the month of November and then you would flip December 1 to the um, Medicaid expansion as long as you met the, all the income requirements and all of the other requirements that are um, required by the state. Okay, what family planning waiver is? Okay, the family planning program is the family planning. It is actually more geared for, the, for pregnant women, for the birth control prevention. Um, it helps with... For women, it check you for breast exams, your annual checkup, um, and your birth control choice of method. For men, it does prostate cancer exams and checks the men and the women for STDs. Anybody from the public have any questions they might have to raise while we got the folks here that can ask my name is Sakila Austin, and I don't have a question, but I have a summary. Mm -hmm. I'm actually the director of Bradshaw Memorial Public Library in Washington County. Mm -hmm. The state has asked the library from North Carolina to assist the U.S. Act with this, and um, Bradshaw started December 1st on Friday. We will be assisting with applications from 9 to 5. Oh, okay. Um, there will be December and January. There's a pallet run. We'll see how it goes. And then when we, when, you know, we may add more more, we're not sure. But it is something that we need to speak about. I spoke to um, DSS and Rocky Mount two days ago. They're going to do a small training for my staff. I have like some, some the same slides and stuff, kind of like the city you have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I've been preparing those videos and tomorrow morning at 8, I'll be training my staff. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that if it's okay. Right. That, Would you mind coming to the microphone oh, okay. so people watching remotely? Can what I want to say is that we welcome people to come to Brasco, like I said, starting December 1st on Friday um, from 9 to 5 to get assistance. But I want to make it very clear we are not social workers, we are not case workers. Everything is kept confidential. We have a computer lab that we do use, but have people space out and I want people to know that we take this very seriously. It's, we're going to hold everything in confidence, but we're only going to provide the information that they have given us. We don't give our opinions. We don't give advice. We don't do the application for everyone. We just assist them with the website and the navigation of it. And they can start and they can finish later on. But I came here tonight because I didn't know if this subject, because I've been to um, Nash earlier. Okay. Uh huh. I didn't know this subject was going to be here as, exactly as well on the agenda, but I know that this information was needed for the citizens. But Braswell is here for, I just want to make it clear, Edgecombe County and Nash County. I think people don't understand that. Um, and, and then I work with all libraries, this, um, whether it's the community college libraries. We, we all work together. And um, we're not the only ones doing it. Uh, I had a, a meeting with the state, uh, North Carolina State Library on October 3rd, October 4th. Like I said, all public libraries are doing this. The directors have agreed to um, help the public with this service. And I just want to say thank you. And it's Brasil from Moore Public Library in Rock Mountain. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Okay. Can you tell us the total number of residents currently on Medicaid? 
Yes, I can. So right now in Edgecombe County, we have 19,154 citizens that are receiving Medicaid. And when we add on the projected number, which is 5,367, we expect to see about 24,521 citizens receiving Medicaid in Edgecombe County. Do you have Medicaid work? Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. So I was getting to that. But yes, we are going, we are asking. I think Eric's going to cover it. Do you want me to mention it or you want to wait? Okay, so we were requesting to use the $260,000 I mentioned to you all to use that to um, get five new positions to assist us. And we went with five because our numbers and the state gave us the numbers of the anticipated increase. And our number is, like I said, 3,171 new enrollees and 2,000 plus of the people from the family <coughs> planning waiver that's going to automatically roll over. I didn't add those numbers in because we don't have to touch those cases. So December the 1st, the 2000 and some um, family planning waiver um, citizens that are receiving that uh, will automatically roll over. Our staff won't have to touch those cases according to what the state is telling us right now. So we're only anticipating having to um, bring um, in five new workers for those 3,000 plus cases. The family planning waiver that Tina mentioned is kind of Weird is the state policy, not ours, because you know we have people that are 70 years old that call us and say, "Why am I getting family planning? I don't need it. I'm 70 years old. I'm not going to have any more children." But it is a requirement of the state. But it's, it turned out to be a good thing because now all of those people are going to automatically roll over to Medicaid expansion. Um, the only other thing I have is the four um, types of um, our four providers is. Um, Tell me, I've seen a healthy blue, healthy blue, well care, United Health Care, and a mirror, a health. Those are the four different. Um, they're PPC brokers, right? They're called the PPC brokers, where they manage your doctor visits and things like that. And then some of the brokers have other things that help the citizens of Edgecombe County and other counties that they do specifically through that broker. Um, and we are told that, you know, we can't, we can't, as caseworkers, we can't advise a client which broker to choose. We have to give them the number and they have to call and talk to the broker itself about what their situation is and what they may, may, may or may not need. Because if you have a child who is who has a lot of health issues and a lot of behavioral issues, they may go, they may not be eligible for a broker. They may have to stay at Medicaid Direct, which is the, just the regular Medicaid card, the gray card that they get in the mail. And we, as social services, we can issue those cards out. We cannot issue any of the broker cards out to the client. Once the client calls and they're on the broker, we just have to give them that broker <coughs> number and they have to do everything. And um, once you uh, make the application, uh, you will be able to choose your broker. Mm -hmm. If you do not choose your broker, they will choose one for you, and you have 90 days to change. So if you go in and you don't know who you want out of the four, um, the state will automatically assign it to your Medicaid expansion will, and you have 90 days to make that change. You can change your broker, and then you can change your provider, your doctor. And I think that's pretty much it. Um, I can't think of anything else that we haven't already talked about. We talked about how long it would take, what happens once you're approved, and if you're still not eligible um, for the Medicaid expansion, you still have the Affordable Care Act that you'll be able to go and apply through there. So um, there are still other options for people that may not be eligible for the Medicaid expansion. <laughs> You said there will be 24,521 people in Edgecombe County for Medicaid expansion? Uh-huh. That's 51% of our population. I know. Yeah, it is. But um, I'm not really surprised. Not really because um, health insurance is so it's so high that a lot of people cannot even afford, afford it. People that are working, you know, health insurance eats up a large portion of their paycheck. So you think about the people that are making twenty thousand dollars a year, you know, a year, um, 
they're not looking at health insurance because they can't afford it. I just wanted to reiterate. I understand. I remember you mentioning that. I did the math, figured it into a percentage for people. I remember you telling me that our numbers were down to like 48,000 something. And I said the same thing when I did the math. I went to have us almost half of it. It's 15.7% of our funding. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Have a question? Yeah. Yes, sir. Just a comment. You, had, you said you have adding 3,000 people in your new health workers. That's all we asked for because of the amount of money that we're doing. Work for 600. Um, they already carry 600. Yeah. We got workers out. Carry, she carried 1,500 cases herself as a as supervisor because of her vacancy. So all of them. You know, we've got the five that we're asking for, but we also have to talk about logistics, like where you're going to put them at. So, you know, we'll, there are a lot of things that go along with that, but yeah, that's all we're asking for, the five. We would like more. Thank you. Thank you. So just to follow up to that, as Ms. Ballard mentioned, we're recommending adding the five positions. Um, and so I, I plan to approve adding those five positions, but we will be bringing back to you a budget amendment that will incorporate the additional funds we're receiving, anticipated, that is the startup funds you mentioned, 200 something thousand, then the anticipated additional revenue for that 75% of those costs for those five employees. So, if you know anyone who uh, may have qualifications for income in this case worker for a partner of social service, please direct me to that website. Please don't uh, next, I'd like to invite Mr. Antoine Brown, our Emergency Services Director, to uh, come to the podium. He's going to be joined with Mr. Jonathan Langley, who's our, who's the Chief of South Edge Coast Volunteer Fire Department. Um, it was brought, Mr. Webb, you brought to our attention, I believe, at our last meeting, concern about an issue of res a response out in the district. So we thought that this would be a good opportunity for Mr. Brown to, first of all, talk about, in more general terms, um, relationship between the county, our volunteer fire departments, typical uh, way things work when a call is call goes out, mutual aid, those types of things. And then Mr. Langley is going to talk some about his his department, at least one of uh, 14 departments in the county, and be happy to answer any questions you might have about that situation or anything else they present. So first, um, Mr. All right, good evening. Uh, I'll jump right in. I prepared a presentation here to kind of guide us through some of the topics we'll need to cover. Um, like Eric said, of course, the roles and responsibilities, and we'll talk about um, contractual agreements that are in place that help us really monitor and make sure uh, we're good stewards of um, what, what we do here and then continue support. All right. Um, so, again, we are we do have um, our protection agent plan is provided by uh, 14 uh, volunteer departments, and then we have three municipal departments, the city of Rocky Mount, town of Tarboro, uh, and the town of Pine Tops. Uh, some of this information I'll try to push through because Chief is kind of redundancy. He's going to kind of come back and talk about some of it, but it's a couple of points I want to make sure we get in my presentation. Um, of course, all of Edgecombe County, we're mandated. We have to provide fire protection. The way we do that, right, is uh, in municipalities or the towns or the cities, and then the other areas outside of those are covered typically by um, volunteer fire departments. As you'll see in some of the stats that will be pushed out um, across the nation, we see that many, uh, much fire protection is provided by volunteer departments. So this is not uh, something that it, that is new. Um, of course, most of our, in, in Edgecombe County, uh, all of our fire departments, of course, provide uh, fire response primarily, right, structural fire response, but they also respond uh, to medical calls. They do community risk reduction, which is getting out in the community, doing a lot of PR events. Uh, provide fire prevention month was last month, so of course, uh, they were extremely active in that. Hazmat traffic accident, gas leaks, and of course, outside fires. And so what you'll see um, in my presentation and in Chiefs is that um, although fire is their primary thing, they uh, engage in many other aspects as well. Um, of, right here, this is a fire protection contract, and so I know a couple of meetings ago, um, I made a comment, I said that the, the volunteer service is not uh, what it used to be, and my, and my point in saying that is that, you know, people aren't as apt to 
volunteer in the fire service. I've been a volunteer uh, for about 12, 13 years. I started uh, straight out of high school. Um, I enjoy, you know, getting on the fire truck, responding to calls, helping those that are in need. Um, and I don't know, people have gotten kind of busy. Um, other priorities have happened. Not really sure. The interest has kind of dropped down. And again, we, we see that locally, but we also see that nationally as well. And Chief will, uh, I won't steal his thunder with some of his presentation. But uh, from our seat at the county, it's our responsibility to make sure that uh, we stand ready uh, to respond in the event that it's necessary. And so all of our departments, they have a biannual agreement that they sign. Uh, so typically it's the fire chief and it's the, the board, their board of directors, their chair um, that signs as well as county manager uh, signs as well. And it pretty much is a, it's, it's a governing document, right, that allows us to monitor, uh, you know, their performance and make sure that they, they're meeting a uh, standard as far as uh, when a call comes out. That, that, that they're able to respond. And so in this instance, um, and I kind of cut a few pieces of, of the contract, uh, but it's really available at our office, and I'm happy to email it over um, to you if you like it. But uh, essentially what, what this is doing is that anytime we have calls come out, right, in our, in our office um, or in the volunteer fire departments, when they're toned out, we typically are notified as well, particularly if, uh, there is a no response or delayed response. Uh, what, what we do see in the county is during the day, of course, most of the volunteers are working. Uh, volunteer fire departments primarily started uh, from uh, like farmers in different communities uh, seeing the need for fire protection or community activists seeing the need for fire protection. And, um, and a lot of them uh, really kind of funding the fire service themselves, their own dollars, uh, kind of protecting uh, their communities from fire. Of course, that's evolved. Um, over time, and we've moved to now um, uh, individual districts uh, having a fire tax uh, to support the, uh, the local departments now to be able to operate. Um, what, what you do see here is is in this, so we, at the county level, we monitor the departments, um, their responses to calls, uh, any type of calls. Uh, we monitor their training hours. We monitor um, their ability to uh, respond within nine minutes, of course, is up here as well. Um, and their rosters, right, having an adequate number of people on the roster uh, to be able to uh, support themselves on the fire scene. Uh, this next slide, again, is a lot of the departments, all of the departments in Edgecombe County, uh, we have uh, in a local agreements, if you will, the, uh, the departments all uh, choose to uh, work together to support each other. Um, and so it's not com it, it is common, excuse me, um, that if you have a call in a local district that you're probably going to get three of the surrounding uh, five districts to, to, to respond with them. Uh, for example, if you have a fire call that comes out in Princeville, uh, you will have Speed, uh, Kanita, and South Edgecombe come as well. And it's not because Princeville can't get there. We recognize that it takes a lot of people to run a fire scene and to extinguish a fire. Um, and a lot of manpower. And so to make that happen, um, that there's automatic aid agreements. When we say automatic aid, that means that they're automatically punched initially uh, when the call uh, comes out. Um, I do have here uh, the communications director, uh, Mike Patagonis on the 911 Center, and a couple of other fire chiefs here just came just to kind of show their support um, because we recognize that this is important, right? This is a top priority to protect, protect lives and property. And so we want to, we take it very seriously. And so um, to be able to speak to this, um, we would definitely want to be able to support. So all of the departments of Edgecombe County, definitely, uh, they kind of come together. They agree uh, to, uh, to to work together. Uh, this specifically kind of speaks to uh, what uh, the non-primary department would bring or their commitment to the other department uh, in a time a call comes out. And this is primarily uh, for structure response, but it also goes um, along with any other type of uh, call, whether it be an uh, uh, outside fire um, or a traffic accident in the area. Um, so before I pass it off to Chief Langley, uh, again, like I talked before, uh, we are seeing a decline in the volunteer service membership, not only locally but nationally. Um, I believe you all have um, some statistics or a handout from the National Volunteer Fire Council that kind of talks about it over time. But I think it's at least worth saying that um, our local departments have been really doing a great job um, with continuing to maintain a continuity of service, uh, considering what, we, what, what we're what we seeing with the decline of membership. 
And so my, my point in saying that hey, we're seeing a decline is really to motivate and promote um, all of our community partners and, and stakeholders to continue to support uh, their local uh, volunteer fire departments. Everybody can't fight fire or pool hoses or or join an active membership, but they can be involved and attend. Um, you know their department meetings. Um, Edgecombe County, we have a public safety association that encompasses all of our local fire departments, uh, municipalities as well, uh, law enforcement and EMS, forestry, power patrol, multiple entities are there. And these are exactly the things that we talk about quarterly um, at these meetings so that we stay ahead of, um, of, of where the, the national decline is kind of hit, headed. So our current posture moving forward uh, from our office is to continue to monitor and support our local fire departments uh, to continue the work they are doing um, as incidents arise. We always investigate them. First and foremost, uh, uh, the chiefs are, are contacted directly um, if there are concerns or things that come up or we need more clarification and they work very diligently with us to uh, provide that information. It's very minimal uh, that, that we have those conversations. Uh, but again, of course, because we have these agreements in place with them, uh, we continue to hold um, that, that compliance piece to make sure that they are meeting standards. And, and if we do see that we get to a place where um, our department is, is low performing or not meeting standard, then we are uh, in a position ahead of time uh, to, to support them as best we can to provide strategies um, and resources. But if it continues to decline, then we know that we're going to have to step in with the plan to be able to continue uh, fire protection services in whatever respect the district that needs. All right. Next. Yeah. Good evening. I'm uh, I'm Jonathan Langley. I'm the fire chief for South Edgecombe Rural Fire Department. Uh, I've got a presentation put together as well. Uh, just a few things that I'd like to cover tonight. Where do you there it is. So I'm here to respond to the concern by the county commissioners in reference to the response that we had and uh, also to educate and provide information about the volunteer fire departments and where we're currently at. Uh, I, I like to give real numbers the best I can. A lot of my information came from the volunteer uh, fire council. So, uh, so that's where we pulled a lot of it from. As far as the incident, it was a grass fire. Uh, dispatch has a grass fire on NC-140. 124 West on August 18th of 2023. Our station is Station 14, South Edgecombe, was dispatched. We had personnel that responded uh, via their privately owned vehicles. Um, and after five minutes, we have a policy in place through the county, as he was talking about, that after five minutes, uh, if they do not get, if the dispatch does not get a response from one of our members saying we're in route, we're on scene, they dispatch the next closest department. Uh, which happened to be Station 13, which is Macclesfield. Uh, so after that five-minute lapse of time, uh, Station 13 was dispatched. And uh, Bacon T Bakertown, as uh, was mentioned, came also. But they came probably 45 minutes or so into the incident and at the request of the on-scene incident commander. Um, some of the things I'd like to talk about is the standard operating procedures that we have in place uh, for when we do have those limited staffing occurrences. It uh, doesn't happen a whole lot, but it does happen every now and then. But uh, the safety that I want to give the community and our commissioners as well is there's a plan in place for it uh, when it does happen. There are things that we have, uh, as the fire chiefs of Edgecombe County and uh, uh, emergency management has put in place to take care of those incidents when you have a department that may not have adequate personnel. Um, and so that procedure actually worked the way that it was intended to that particular night. Uh, this incident happened on a Friday night, and it was around 6, 6.30 in the evening. And the incident actually lasted until a little after midnight. So it was a pretty long, drawn-out incident. Um, just to talk about the response schedule for that particular area, uh, Station 14 is the primary end district uh, for South Edgecombe. Michaelsville would be second end. West Edgecombe and Lewis Community would be the third and fourth. We have a four-department response for every area of our district, and it depends on what area it is. Um, which departments go, but that was the response schedule for that particular district. Uh, we talked about Bakertown. Uh, Bakertown is on Station 13's response schedule, and they run close in to the Wilson County line. Uh, they actually had an incident this afternoon where Michaelsfield went into 
Wilson County to assist them with a structure fire and a grass fire. Uh, so it, it's a common thing for us to cross the county line to be able to help each other out. Um, and as a fire chief, I will say, I don't condone us not getting a truck in route. I'm not here to really defend that because there's no excuse for it. Um, I, I could sit and blame it on staff and I, there's a lot of things I could blame it on, but reality is the public expects us to show up and we failed to do so. So I'll, I'll own that as a fire chief. Um, but what I will say is that I don't condone it, but it does happen. And when it does happen, the policy worked like the way that it should have. Uh, that particular incident ended up being a gas leak, an underground LP cylinder. Uh, so the best course of action was to let it burn until the gas department could get on scene and get it taken care of. They ended up uh, opting to burn, burn the tank off, burn all the fuel out of the tank that night. So they rerouted it and we stood by basically for the length of that incident while they burned it off and got everything controlled. Um, so I, I will ask if you have any questions on that incident. I'll be more than happy to answer them. But if not, I'm going to move forward. Any questions? I got one quick question. Go yes, sir. Are you telling me station personnel responded after five minutes with an apparatus came on? No, sir. They actually responded. They, one of their officers checked in route, and they had an additional tone out at the 10-minute mark um, at the request of the incident commander that was on scene with the radio. I mean, I was in the law department for years, and I, I, I agree and understand everything. <coughs> I, I was curious why they didn't respond. So, it, it is, um, and the the gentleman that actually checked in route lives a little closer to that area, so he didn't drive back to the station right. to get an apparatus. Yeah. Um, I live locally in that area also, and truthfully, I would I wouldn't have drove all the way to Pine Tops to get an apparatus. I'd have went to the scene to start doing what I could do, and then requested resources as necessary. Um, again, not best practice, but we we try to look out for each other in the different areas. We we know where our volunteers live, so um, so we try to look out for each other in that aspect to keep us from having to drive so far, but also to get people on scene quicker. Um, and we don't always hear, as far as dispatch, they don't always catch our members checking on scene because they don't all have radios. Um, just your officers are going to be the ones with radios, and then we have radios on the trucks once they get there. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to cover a few uh, national statistics. I guess it's, if it'll move. I don't know where I'm supposed to be pointing. There it goes. So across the nation, we have 29,452 departments nationwide. 18,873 are all volunteer departments. They don't have any paid staff. They get no monetary recovery. There's 5,335 that are mostly volunteer. That means they probably have some sort of paid staff Monday through Friday or maybe one or two days a week, something of that sort. You have 2,459 that are mostly career. That would be your departments that are similar to Tarver that um, they have a career paid guys there, but they are supplemented by volunteers. And then there's 2,785 that are all career departments. In other words, they don't have any volunteers. Everybody is paid members. In 2018, seven, 745,000 volunteer firefighters were reported in uh, North Carolina, uh, or across the nation, excuse me. That's 28 volunteer firefighters per department on average. Um, the total calls that were run across the nation was 36,746,500. Uh, you can see in 2019, the volunteers started to drop off. It dropped down to 722,800 uh, volunteer firefighters across the nation. That dropped that average number down to 27. And then the call volume went up in 2019 to 37,272,000. In 2020, you see our numbers dropped again. If we all remember what happened in 2020, COVID hit. A lot of people got scared when COVID hit, and we run medical calls in the volunteer fire service just as well as any other, uh, any other emergency medical things. We run those type of calls, so there were people that got scared of it, and they completely got out. They said, I don't have to be here, so they walked away from it. Um, you got 25 people on average per department across the nation. And when I say on average, they, that means you could have some departments that have 40, 45 members, but on the flip side of that, you have some that may not have the 14 or 15. Um, 
And then the call volume dropped a little bit in 2020 because we kind of reined back on running the medical calls. We let EMS handle that. And that was by design. Our county actually did that. The volunteers quit running medical calls across the board during COVID to protect and give that reserve in case we did have fires or other types of emergencies. So our numbers across the nation are actually declining at a regular basis, on a regular basis and a regular rate. The 2021 and 2022 numbers have not come out yet. Um, in Edgecombe County, and I'll speak to this specifically, you heard there's 14 departments that receive funding from our tax, our fire tax in Edgecombe County. We have three departments that are municipalities for a total of 17. Rocky Mount, Tarver, and Pine Tops are not funded through the county fire tax. They're funded through the municipalities. You have Sharpsburg, Battleburg, Sharp Point, Whitakers, and Fountain that receive funding from Edgecombe County, but they're not actually considered Edgecombe County departments. These are departments that are that may be have their stations in Nash County, but they're close enough to the line to run with us and have areas in our district. Then you have Hartsey's, Principal Speed, South Edgecombe, Macclesfield, Leggett, West Edgecombe, Lewis Community, and Canada that are all funded through our, through our fire tax. So there's 12 OSFM registered Edgecombe County fire departments. The ones that are all volunteer include Macclesfield, Canada, Speed, Leggett, Lewis, and Pine Tops. That means they don't receive, they don't have any paid staff here today. They don't have anybody that helps out other than their volunteers. They're completely supported by volunteers. Our mostly volunteer departments are West Edgecombe, South Edgecombe, Brunswick, and Hartsey's. West Edgecombe has a program they run on. They run a paid staff with one person per day, Monday through Friday, eight to five. South Edgecombe is in a similar situation. Uh, we run one person Monday through Friday, eight to five. I think Principal's Department, if I'm not mistaken, has a three day uh, where they have two people three days out of the week. And then Park C's program, I'm not 100% sure on what they're actually doing, um, but they, they have some sort of paid staff off and on throughout the, um, the course. And then you have your other two departments that you see there at the bottom. So out of our mostly volunteer departments, I'm going to give you the numbers of where we're really at. Uh, West Edge Home has two stations. They have primary station and substation. They have 37 members on their roster. One thing that I want you to remember about these roster numbers is it includes your auxiliary members, which are not interior firefighters, and it also includes the two members. These numbers are going through the county's workers' comp on the teams. So Macclesfield has one station with 19 members. South Edge Home has two stations with 38 members. I can attest to where we're currently at because of my involvement. We have five paid staff members right now in that 38. We have two, actually, 22 volunteers, five junior members, and six auxiliary members. So when you're talking about a weekend or an average of five Monday through Friday, we have 22 volunteers that are ready to respond. The thing about that that I want to speak on to is of those 22 volunteers, we have 12 working some sort of form of emergency service. So 
fish challenge. And this is where the rubber meets the road and where we can actually say, what can we do to fix things? So time demands on um, family, work, school, college, sports, other clubs, that's what's taken away from your from your local fire, volunteer fire plants. You have training requirements, call volume, uh, change in the nature of the business. Um, and when I talk about that, it's rising costs and abuse of services by the public. Um, running the most multiple EMS incidents for stump toes and things like that, uh, it, it takes its toll on the volunteers. Um, and then greater public expectation of the fire department response and our capabilities. Uh, Mr. Brown actually spoke of how many different things we've been involved in. Uh, it's not just fire department anymore. It's hazmat, it's EMS. It's, it's a lot more to it than what it used to be. Uh, the change in sociological conditions, leadership problems, aging communities, and then internal conflicts. Those are the things that we face when we talk about recruitment and retention. And I want to speak uh, specifically on the three that I highlighted. Um, so what can we do? Our changes in sociological conditions the recruitment takes time, uh, and let's be real, we're already volunteers and spending more time doing recruitment, uh, it, it's tough. It takes money to be able to put the things together and that takes money from our actual firefighting capabilities and it puts more stress on our department members. It's a necessity, but of only a limited number of people actually believing us in recruitment and, and looking into this stuff to get involved in it. So of those 22 you that I have in my department, you might have five or six that actually believe enough in recruitment to show up and help the them. They'll show up to the fire, but they're not going to show up to the recruitment events. Um, and, and that's not saying anything bad about them. They have obligations at home and work and everywhere else too. So what we're currently doing for South Edgecombe in recruitment aspects is uh, word of mouth. That's, our, that's one of our best tools. Walking in and getting to know somebody, say, hey, you interested in joining the volunteer fire department? It's a good place to hang out. We'll teach you some things that are going to help you in life, especially as younger folks. Uh, it, we'll teach you things that will help you. And, and that word of mouth is a great tool. Um, we, we focus on parades. We do a couple of parades throughout the year. We have career days that we go to with the, at the local schools. We put signs out in front of the stations. We do social media outreach. And, and we currently have planned involvement in the public safety program that's getting up and going to Southwest Head High School. Uh, that's going to be a great tool for us. We've actually got a couple of junior members that come in recently because of that program that's starting up. So what we need um, from a volunteer fire department standpoint is we need our communities to get involved and help us out. Um, we need help in recruitment and retention. Um, we need people to encourage their younger family members to get involved. To, to take some pride and ownership in your community and where you actually live and step up and say, I, I want this to be a better place and this is a way that I can do it. So there's a place for everybody. And so we're looking for people to get involved. Um, so when I talk about our training requirements and the change in the nature of the business, our stations, equipment, and training, we need to focus more on quality rather than quantity. Uh, this is gonna help with retention because People won't stay at an apartment where they can't go and learn, and they won't stay where they don't have the appropriate equipment to do the job correctly. Um, in in Edgecombe County, we currently have three uh, Office of State Fire Marshal, that's OSFN, that are approved training facilities. That's almost, um, it's one of those places we have to have a place that we can go and train. Sitting in front of a computer screen is not gonna work anymore. Being able to go out and burn houses like we used to is almost unheard of because of all the requirements that's been placed on us. So we're developing these training facilities. You've probably been down 258, seen big comments boxes, or been through Florida and seen their comments boxes. But all of these training facilities are being built. The association has decided to, to, to we talked, heard Mr. Brown talk about our association. We decided to conduct four county-wide trainings a year where we get all the departments in there come down together and we train together four times a year. And that's hosted at one of these facilities, so we're able to get good quality training. Then you have um, cost, that's always a factor. And I'm not one to sit and talk about money a whole lot, but you can see here that apparatus costs are above $600,000. Y'all um, agreed to purchase a fire truck for the county not too long ago, uh, right at $600,000, not a little more. Um, the truck that you see pictured in the top is a 2009. That's our newest truck in the fleet at South Edgecombe. 
and we purchased it for two hundred seventy-two thousand dollars in two thousand nine. So that's the difference in what the cost has gone up to, um, and then gear and all the other equipment that we had is going up to. We we reach out and we do grants through the state. We do grants through uh, other other agencies to help kind of uh, fund this stuff. But it's tough. Um, writing those grants takes time, and again, it's a volunteer or organization, so it takes time. Um, so, what can you do from as a commissioner standpoint, as a community standpoint? You can get involved. Ask your local departments about volunteering. Um, is there something you can? There's something you can do, regardless of your age. We have auxiliary members. We have junior membership. We need people to, to train these younger people. And it doesn't necessarily just have to be in fire department. They need to train the business aspect. They just the, the volunteer fire departments are business. And so we need the help with training and those aspects for the people coming up. Um, learn your local fire department and its needs. They have regular meetings, training events, find out when they are on show up. Ask them, hey, hey, what are you got going on? How, how do you handle this like this? Um, what, what do you do in this situation? You can ask those questions. Contact me but via email, southeastronfire.com. If you have questions that you may think of later on that you want answered, I'll be happy to answer any of them that I can. Again, I thank you for your time and for listening to me. And if you have any questions now, I'll answer them the best that I can. Any questions? I just don't think I have a comment. The presentation is such a picture. Theater programs to our professional fire departments, okay, and they come training, uh, almost training. They might have to do some different kind of training for other departments, but I, I, I certainly support those efforts in terms of anything that our board can do because uh, we do ask you, we do volunteer with that service, and uh, a lot of the public understand that some of the insurance rates they get because of that. Thank you so much for the volunteers. I, I just want to commend Mr. Brown and Mr. Langley. Mr. Langley gave me a call at home. I guess I'm the cause of the fact of his presentation. But uh, Mr. Langley, thank you so much. We appreciate your response. And uh, you know, as a commissioner, when I have a concerned citizen, I did my part. You've done your part, and we all do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we better understand your part. <laughs> Next, we have with us tonight Mr. Sherrod Knox. He's with an organization called When People Work. And they do good work um, to assist people who are justice impacted. And, and in fact, they've done some work more specifically with our sheriff's office. And Mr. Knox will share with you more about uh, the work. Thank you. 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 Th
Good evening, everyone. My name is Sean Johnson. This is Ray Ben Amy from the program director. She's going to give you all a copy of the presentation. Uh, I'll tell you that the one thing that is I got a chance to speak with Mr. Evans at the The one thing that I get kind of disappointed is that people are kind of wondering kind of what uh, costs, what, 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 how we do this, how we're able to bring all these services to your area. We're able to do this through a unique public private partnership called the Table Success Contract. Um, there are none in North Carolina right now, but there are multiple examples federally and in other states as well. The way it works is we have our uh, backed by a private funder, Make Home Capital, they're an offshoot of Goldman Sachs. And what they do is they fund uh, programs like this to help the community that's living their entire existence is to fund organizations like this. The way they do it is they, anything that we do, so anything from, uh, we're partnering in Wilson contracts and build, helping to rebuild an apartment complex for low income people, all the way to uh, case workers that bring people and help them out. And what they do, they agree to fund us fully for five years. And on the front of that, what happens is we, as we have government partners or that the government partner serves two purposes. One is for data collection and data, that kind of thing. We managed to do that through the sheriff, um, and so we, we have the basic data. The second thing is, um, it's called paper success because if our program doesn't work, we don't get to paper success, and we're constantly evaluated by it. Each person that comes to our program is looking at the computer system, everything from doctor's appointment, job, job training, interview, anything else like that. Each of those things are documented. So what we what we do is at the end of the five years we come back to you all. Well, well the, the agreement is lined up in the until you get it. so it's no surprise cost or anything else like that. But um, we come back and we evaluate how successful the program is. Done. As the, the program has saved you all some money, we ask for a portion of that back to keep the program running. So say for instance we saved you hundred bucks, um, we ask for like about 30, 40 bucks to keep the program running. Um, State of North Carolina tells us it costs about fifty to fifty-four thousand dollars to depend on the facility per person per year to keep a person in prison in North Carolina. So our program is certainly significantly less expensive than that. Um, we have a video that we queued up that I'm hoping uh, we will show that because we wanted to get some, some testimonials from your sheriff's department as well as see some people who go to our program.
And while they're, while they're working on that, there'll be four or five ones. Go ahead. participants when I do a pen take, we it's like a foundation to me. So you have to have a driver's license or ID, a social security card, and a birth certificate. Because depending on what we're going to do, if you need a job, some of those documents are going to be requested. Seems small and ridiculous, but uh, I wouldn't want to do it in my situation. So that's a short video that kind of shows some of the work that we can help. Um, just to, to this point up in the beginning, um, we operate currently in Wilson, Edgecombe, Pitt, and County of Raleigh. So like some of them are from a little bit from all over, so the participants are. Um, but yeah, also I want to give a thank you to some of my staff who stayed over late tonight to help me out with this presentation and, and, and to the sheriff's office as well. Um, what questions do you all have? Any questions? Um, our, our headquarters is in Raleigh. Um, right now we kind of, we, again, because we work so closely with the, with the individual jail here, um, we go in and out of jail. So our case workers come to the jail and operate that. How long have you said you've been in our area? Uh, in Edgecombe County, I believe it was January? Yeah, I believe it was in January we came. So, well, first of all, I'd love the chance to get a, uh, to get a chance to meet with you all more outside of this to get a full breakdown of, of um, what a paper success. Okay, well, like, ultimately, what I'd love is a paper success with Edgecombe County. Well, uh, uh, certainly, I could take a talk with Evans. Uh, okay. Um, you know, I'm, we got some folks up there because it's, it's, it's the savings they're interested in. Okay. <laughs> it's the savings to our county. We certainly would, 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 would be interested in. We've always shown an interest in reentry. Okay. 
that they can bring in uh, kind of good support that really could. So continue to talk to Ms. Evans and, uh, uh, and look at what you might be requesting for us. Yes, sir. And, and you, I was say one more point I, I realized I missed. A part of paper success is that if uh, we come to the end of the five-year limit and we've not saved off any money, it's no repayment whatsoever. So it's, again, it's all... Well, I, I guess... Uh, we we gonna say it might be some deep <laughs> in terms of we do come back and make that request, but uh, 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 depending upon it, I think many of us would be faithful. Okay, if you can show us or you saved us, okay, uh, mm -hmm. I think we, we I'll say publicly we we'll, we certainly will get it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Very much. You're very okay. Do we have anything? At this time, we'll take public petitions. Uh, is there anybody here from the public that would like to speak? Please come and state your name and address for the public petition. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is James Wren, 704 AC Highway, 97 East in Lake. I'm the Vice President of the Phoenix Historical Society, African American History of H. Combe County. And on behalf of our President, Mayor Stith, and the members of the Phoenix Society, I want to thank this board for continuing to support us. We had two very successful events this spring. The, uh, the premiere of the film, We Can Do Better, which highlighted the uh, campaign just to keep IBP out of Hcombe County. And we also unveiled a North Carolina Civil Rights Trail marker to the East Harbor Citizens League uh, here in Harbor, Long Street. Um, this Saturday, uh, November 11th, at 11 o'clock at Red Hill Missionary Baptist Church, we will be unveiling a new North Carolina Highway historical marker uh, that recognizes some history that we have uh, recovered and researched and brought out of the, uh, brought up that has not been recognized. Uh, of meetings of free people in 1866 in the, the uh, area of Northern Edgecombe County that uh, there are hundreds of uh, free black people were gathered have meet, having meetings trying to set up the Equal Rights League and fighting for higher wages, voting rights, and self-defense. This was during the time period people were, were free from slavery but not yet had the right to vote and the powers that be were trying to turn the clock back. Uh, and people stood up. People, farm workers in this county stood up and made a difference. And uh, we're going to program will be at the Red Hill Missionary Baptist Church this Saturday at 11 o'clock, and uh, our speaker will be David, Dr. Historian Dr. David Soselski, and you can pass these around. Everybody's welcome. The, 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 the marker will read, Equal Rights League, Newly Freed People, 1866, rallied at Hammond Hill here, for voting rights, fair wages, and self-defense, became an early civil rights organization.
part of that. We don't leave out anyone when it comes down to Eshcon and Eshcon history. Also, y'all have on your agenda tonight a resolution in the honor of Mr. Walter Kimball Jr. Mr. Walter Kimball, who continues to be excellent service to Eshcon County for many years and many capacity. And I stand here proudly tonight display you all some wax. This is a record that we recorded down at Kalita High School in the auditorium in 1970 under the directorship of Mr. Walter Cummings Jr. I was 17 years at the time, 53 years ago. But I, I didn't just bring one, I brought two. I want y'all to get a feel of it. Of not too many black high schools in the state <coughs> Nobody can play it all but me. We also see on y'all's agenda, y'all have a resolution to support Princeton with the name of the grid. We ask that y'all do that if you wish. And on December the 23rd, I at Cherry Hill Church, y'all should have a copy of that as well. We're going to do a concert in honor of Mr. Plummer. He touched the lives of many of the people in this area. And we just want to carry on his legacy. Uh, so at Cherry Hill on December the 23rd at 3 o'clock, we're going to do a Christmas concert in his honor. And y'all know there's, there's another attachment I have. If you look to the back row, you can see someone that you should have recognized. But that was 53 years ago. So I have changed somewhat since that time, but I still don't know. <laughs> and also, I want to ask y'all to do this for the town of Princeville. This is my friend, uh, General Hughes Shelf. Most people know General Hughes Shelf and that joint chief of staff, and that's what this all here kind of gives a little history. Mr. Manager, I'm going to do this. Oh, yeah, I can have a couple of I have two things. And I didn't go back and dig this up. I got this out of the Welcome to Carver magazine. Many of y'all in the audience know them. <laughs> but General Shelf and I, believe it or not, we were raised up on the same farm, his family farm, and he worked on the farm just like everybody else did. And I was telling the county manager, his grandmother was a school teacher, and his grandfather was a, what they call, county auditor for Edgecombe County. As I understand it from General Shelf, from years ago, they didn't refer to him as county manager, they were referred to as county auditor. And when I came to know the county, they were county manager, and Alan B. Harrell was the manager at that time. And that's one problem, piece. I'm giving y'all another piece, because I want y'all to help promote the town of Princeville. Uh, on the back of this, if you ride through Edgecombe County, you'll see signs that say, Welcome to Edgecombe County, home of General Hugh Shelton. Some of y'all have seen those signs. If you go out,
about further than speed. Nashville. Anybody else for public Budget amendments for your approval and a few others for your review. I'll draw your attention to those at the front of your uh, groupings of budget amendments there. You see budget amendment number one. As you will know, at your last meeting, you uh, directed the staff, you agreed to appropriate a million dollars of fund balance to purchase vehicles for the sheriff's office. This is a budget amendment to capture that. What you'll also see in that budget amendment is uh, we recently sold um, some cars that you surplus a few months ago uh, to the tune of a little over $24,000. So this budget amendment recommends reappropriating that money into the same capital outlay line. Also, $73,582 uh, insurance proceeds to vehicles that were involved in an uh, accident, sheriff's vehicles that were totaled. So those are the payoffs for those two vehicles. So recommending that we appropriate a million for that, 24,000 for a surplus vehicle sold, as well as proceeds from the uh, from the insurance on those two vehicles into capital outlay for purchase of vehicles for the sheriff property. Um, it, just as a note that um, we have that out to bid now for per, uh, vehicles as well as upfit of those vehicles. Um, that was out for, uh, for about three weeks, I believe it was. We only received two bids. Our procurement policy says that we have to go out a second time. The second time, uh, we can receive only one bid, and we can still proceed. That would be a contract to be brought back for your approval. Those second round of bids are due back this Thursday. Budget amendment number two is uh, you originally appropriated um, or reserved of ARPA funds or ARPA enabled funds, $220,000 to purchase heavy equipment in South Waste Department. Uh, we purchased a new uh, backhoe there for a uh, little around $180,000. The balance of that $40,218 is remaining, and so recommending that we roll that forward to current year's capital outlay to purchase um, a compactor for one of our. Uh, convenient sites um, for solid waste department. Budget amendment number three is, um, this is in health department, this is a routine budget amendment. You see relatively small numbers there, but the reason that it is included here in the section where you must approve is because it includes uh, moving some funds out of uh, salary. And this is for some funding received from the state. As you'll recall, one of the provisions uh, with our budget amendments is that anything that involves um, anything that involves movement of money in or out of a salary or salary related lines regardless of the amount must be approved by you. Budget amendment number four um, again this is uh, uh, funding received in healthy communities uh, program bringing this to you because this also includes appropriation or part of budget budget amendment includes a salary line. Budget, budget Amendment 4A, this is COVID Enhancement Funds. These are, again, state funds for the Health Department, appropriating those funds to the Health Department. Budget Amendment 4B. Um, there were three uh, vehicles planned and budgeted in the FY23 budget, uh, one for planning, one for the Health Department, one for the Tax Administration Office. Um, we worked very hard, as you know, with limited supply of vehicles, not been able at that time to identify vehicles to purchase that were suitable for those departments. Uh, we believe we have identified those, those vehicles available now, so recommending that you roll forward what was previously appropriated in FY23 in capital outlay um, to current year's budget. So those are the budget amendments that work, require your approval. I'm happy to answer any questions about those or any of the other budget amendments. Um, I, I just want to thank staff and all staff for the, these are the best prepared budget amendments since I've been a commissioner that I've seen. I mean, the detail, detailed descriptions and very minimal corrections or, or changes. And so just thank you for taking the time to make sure that those are done correctly um, and for 
helps us as we review these and other options. So thank you for that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Last budget amendment is what, one through what? Uh, budget amendment is one through four. Next is regarding a resolution to approve and plan for county line merger transition. Uh, attached for your review is a county line merger transition plan, which is due for submission to the North Carolina State Board of Education by November 15th. You will see that the plan is in two parts, detailing the respective size of the merger for each school system. A few modifications have been made since our joint meeting on October 16th. I'll point, uh, direct your attention to those changes and or additions in just a second. Um, all four boards are asked to consider the enclosed resolution to approve the plan and authorize its submission before the deadline of November the 15th. Um, the Nash County Board of Commissioners met this morning. Word that I got from the managers that they did um, approve, adopt the resolution to approve the plans as presented. I believe uh, the school districts are meeting tonight. Um, and so we'll hear if, it's, uh, if they will approve those. Do recommend that you approve the plan as presented, subject to some minor technical technical corrections uh, that Mr. Peters and I will agree to. If there are any, we believe there will be a couple um, that if uh, staff will agree to, and I'll point out a couple of things that might be. Um, I do want to uh, I want to point out that uh, in uh, in your packet was a copy of the uh, the resolution for approval. Uh, there's been uh, an update, uh, an update to that from the copy that you had in your agenda packet. You do have an updated copy of the resolution at your place. Um, the thing that was added uh, since the, the agenda packet went out would be, if you look at the one uh, loose at your place, the next to the last whereas on the front page uh, states that the board. Uh, the boards have identified no remaining issues they believe cannot be resolved by continuing cooperation of the parties. I believe that that was the, the addition made since the copy went out in your agenda packet. I want to point out a few things uh, in the plan itself. Some of those would be changes uh, uh, from what you saw at the joint meeting uh, back in October. Some are, were existing at the time. I just want to draw your attention. So. Just following through in your agenda packet, of course, the first you'll see uh, is Edgecombe School's side of the transition plan. First, I want to point out, if you'll turn to page 7 of Edgecombe School's section of the transition plan. You'll see uh, down the uh, second half of the page, or it's titled Preparation of Budgets and Funds, Contracts, Obligations, Assets, and Liabilities. Um, those bullet points there on the second half of that page outlines, proposed how we in particular, how Edgecombe County, will fund or will not fund cert certain things moving forward uh, in the transition. Um, I'm happy to, I don't know if you want me to read through those, but. We have discussed those before. You're aware of those, but I want you to know that they now this has now been added into the plan itself. It is also it also shows up on the Nash County Nash County School side of the plan as well. So it would be consistent between both sides of, of the plan. Uh, again, just to remind you, I think you you'll remember. I want to make sure that the public knows that though there are two sides of this, this will be submitted as one plan under the umbrella of this joint resolution that all four boards are adopting uh, either early today or, or tonight. Um, also on page, on the next page, uh, page eight. At the top of page eight, here are some additional points that have been added. Um, for example, you'll see at the top, it says current expense currently allocated to national Public, Nash County Public Schools. Of the $2,188,320 base current expense payment, that's what we, Edgecombe County, we have been budgeting for a number of years now. We refer to that as the current expense, the base payment 
uh, approximately 550,000 of that will be remaining uh, will be the remaining allocation to Nash County Public Schools to cover those 10th through 12th graders. As you all will remember, just to make sure everyone here in the audience knows that the transition will happen July of 24, July of next fall. The decision has been made and agreed upon all four uh, boards and it is included in this plan that those rising 10th through 12th graders, <clears throat> excuse me, who live on the Edgecombe County side of Rocky Mount but have been going to a high school in, on the, in Nash County schools will be given the option to continue to go to that high school, to finish out their high school career there. And therefore, we having some ongoing current expense obligation for those remaining students. At this point, and this is just estimate, you'll be given a more definite budget number when it comes to budget time. Estimate is approximately 550,000 of that um, will remain to be budgeted to Nash County schools for those students. Therefore, of the 2.188 million, approximately 1.6 million may be available to appropriate to Edgecombe Public Schools. Again, we want to put the word may be available because that's still a budgetary decision which you get to make uh, from budget time uh, in next spring. Annual capital and debt service in Nash County Public Schools, approximately 450000 that either is or was going to Nash County Schools for annual capital and debt service may be available to appropriate to Edgecombe Public Schools. We phrase it like that because in this current year, FY24, um, the budget that you all approved, um, we are paying debt service for uh, to Nash County Schools, but we're not paying current uh, annual capital. So all of that, the, the total of the annual capital debt service and capital gap, that will be available then to appropriate to Edgecombe schools instead of Nash schools. Uh, the plan, is, as was on page seven, states that come the fall of next year, we will no longer continue to pay debt service or any annual capital to Nash County schools. And again, that's something that all four boards are, uh, we expect, agreeing on tonight. Um, the last budget there says the local cost of the supplement and benefits for staff positions in the four schools will need to be accounted for uh, by Edgecombe County. Um, so uh, those teacher positions, there are about 100 positions, a little over 100 positions, um, the supplement, that it is 10% now in Edgecombe schools, we'll have to apply to those as well. So we will have to budget for that in the upcoming year. But again, we will have available to us those numbers that I just shared with you just a moment ago. Um, also under uh, budget transfer process, I want to note there that it says Edgecombe Public Schools will identify and address all legal and regulatory requirements and frameworks governing transfer of assets and budgets between the, school, the two school districts in accordance with applicable laws, regulations, and contractual obligations. Um, so uh, that's a broad statement in particular that refers to, you, we've had a conversation about assets that were purchased um, with federal funds. Um, and so that is still, uh, a final number is unknown. Uh, and so this statement is included in both sides of the plan. Um, Everyone at this point believes that using instead of uh, the depreciating the depreciated value instead of using that using fair market value that number is going to be much less than what was in, uh, originally uh, expected. Um, they are still uh, both uh, staff and both school systems are still working on finalizing that number, um, and that refers to the next point as well under transfer transfer and acquisition of uh, assets. I do also want to point out, if you turn over a couple pages to page 10, you'll see here on the Edgecombe side of the plan, <clears throat> the recommended school configuration. As we know, the fall of next year, those ninth grade students uh, that formerly had gone to Nash County School or would have gone to Nash County School High School to be coming to Edgecombe School um, up until the last joint 
meeting, uh, the two options that were on the table were either to send those students to North Edgecombe High School, or they were considering a building that's called the Incubator Building in Fountain Park and Rocky Mount. It's a facility that's becoming available. Um, the, the school board has decided uh, for the time being um, to move forward with planning to transfer those ninth graders to North Edgecombe High School. Um, they looked at just the time of preparing that incubator building, um, there's just not enough window of time there, and, and, and the board has decided that they their plan to move forward, those ninth graders, uh, taking them to North Edgecombe. So that is a revision uh, in the plan. Of course, there will still be decisions to make as far as uh, long term uh, when those 10th and 11th and 12th grade students will transfer over. I also want to point out on page 12, uh, near the top of page 12, really the first bullet there at the top of page 12, uh, there's been some question about bus, the transfer of buses as part of the assets that will transfer, 72 passenger versus the 68 passenger buses, I believe, uh, 65 passenger buses. Edgecombe Schools Garage cannot handle the longer, larger buses. Um, so you'll see here included in the plan is that Edgecombe and Nash Schools Transportation Departments they're working with DPI to transfer approximately 20 72 passenger buses from Nash to another local public school unit. And then that local public school unit will then transfer the appropriate number of 65 passenger buses to Edgecombe Schools. I also want to point out, I must admit that I was a little confused on this initially. Uh, I think initially there was some thought that the smaller bus meant an older bus, and that's not, not that's not necessarily the case. They still make both size buses, so that does not though us Edgecombe schools getting those smaller buses that mean uh, older bus it just means it's a small bus, um, and so just want to make sure I'm, I made that uh, made that point. Um, I believe those were all of the additions or changes or things that I wanted to point out um, in the uh, Edgecombe School side of the plan. Now on the on the Nash side, if you keep on turning, if you turn to page uh, 11, I believe there are page numbers at the bottom of the last frame. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And you'll see Nash, Nash School Plan, the one that's in your agenda packet, still has that watermark there of draft. Notified not it was draft. Actually, sent me this afternoon uh, the final copy without that watermark. I do want to point out something that is different from the what's in your agenda packet, and you have a copy of it at your seat. And um, they still uh, here estimate that under the subheading of uh, fiscal impact approximately $3.4 million of uh, federal uh, federal funding, local or federal funding, um, will follow those students from Nash County Schools to, to, to Edgecombe Schools. But in, in the latest page, and this is what was adopted by Nash County Board of Commissioners, I want you to see this because this will be a part of the plan. Um, here is where they add the language that you saw over in the Edgecombe Schools plan that talks about that same statement that reads, if ECPS and NCPS are working in collaboration with the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, U.S. Department of Education to determine the reasonable fair market value of federally funded assets and how ECPS will acquire selected assets. It's the exact same statement that you saw over in the Edge Home School. So that was not in the <coughs> topic that you got, that you saw at the October meeting that I sent to you last week, but I want you to know that that has, that has been added. Um, everything else uh, in the NASH plan um, is as you've seen in your agenda packet. I do want to point out uh, on page 18, on page 18 outlines their timeline for uh, enrollment and assignment of students. Um, as you know, those students who live on the Edgecombe County side of Rocky Mount, but there will be 10th through 12th graders who will be given the option to continue going to a 
high school and Nash County schools. The timeline here specifies, you'll see April of 24, that they can choose if they want to to go ahead and move and transition on over to Edge Home Schools. They don't have to wait. They, if they don't want to finish out where they started, they can transition on over. Um, but of course, as you know, they need to know that by a certain time so that they can make plans. So that time is April the 1st. So the deadline for parents of those students making that decision um, is April 1st. If you read the details of the plan, it says information will, be, will go out to every student, every household that's affected, giving them more details on the process for that, and, and they will be notified of that. Um, actually, it'll go out in January. But their deadline to make that decision um, is, is April of 2020. How will they know when they transition to? They'll be told at that time. It will, I think it will depend on, you know, uh, they, they'll have some options. They'll either early college or normal school. So those, uh, those are, are the main changes. Um, it, it was noted that on, on one particular page um, that there's a correction that needs to be made uh, where there's a link to a file, a list of the assets that notes a uh, list of uh, depreciated assets. So that looked to be something that needs to be corrected instead of using the word depreciation to use fair market value. So my recommendation would be to, um, to approve plan as presented, those changes noted, resolution that you have there, and to authorize Mr. Peters and myself to agree to any minor technical corrections that need to be made. Would that be fair? Any, any questions? That's right. I mean, the, the plan itself describes the plan for transitioning students and assets. You, there are still decisions, uh, you know, to be made on several things. Um, and and on, for, for you in particular, there's budgetary decisions. Somebody pointed that out to me. I can't tell you how they got two million. And we did. I know how they got it. I'm just wondering why none of our people on that state level question why they got it. And why it's going to be getting? It's going to cost us money just like it's going to cost them money in this commercial. So it concerned me that our elected and raw didn't see that when the budget went through. I didn't question it. Well, I, I don't think we're in a position to kind of really question you or not. <laughs>
sometimes it's not necessarily a public conversation. Whenever I, I don't vote to approve something or give a nay, I always like to give some context without having to say it. So um, I would here, and it's kind of what everyone else has said here, is this document, the Edgecombe County side is very vague. It, it, if you look at these words, it's to determine fiscal availability. We will engage in discussions. We will engage in discussions. We will determine. We will work alongside. We, in the difference in pay scales, we will determine. We, we're voting on something, we're, we're approving a document that has not been determined. We have no answer to what is determined. So we're, we're voting on something, and then the things that they've determined, in our school demerger plan for bus coordinators, we are appropriating four bus coordinators for Tarboro, North, South, and Rocky Mountain. So in our demerger plan, or our merger plan, excuse my language, is um, we are now organizing bus coordinators throughout the county as opposed to just the merger. And then in this, this is the first time this has been brought up. We're going to build a bus storage and maintenance facility, but we don't have the ability to service 72 passenger buses. And our document says we're getting 65 passenger buses. In Nash County's document, it says we're getting 66 passenger buses. Understand that, but we're voting to approve it. The manager recommends it to approve the document that we're saying has errors. In. Well, uh, what's going on is we're saying that um, if we do nothing, uh, we have a merger coming. Okay, that's mandated by the General Assembly. I think in the span of this, uh, and a majority of all of this effort is planned. Once it's mandated, we have to fund the bill. You know, that we can fund it. So it's coming at us anyway, regardless of what this goal. We can do no plan and send nothing back, and we got a merger. It's coming at us in the future. So I think that, I think, I guess we could call it a living document in terms of, we really don't know how many students uh, that's in the uh, tent. Stand. So the school board really can't give us figures until they get the actual number of students that will be staying in that county. A number of those students might decide to stay, or those rising seniors and juniors might decide to stay, might decide to go to this one school. So I think that's one of the reasons that that that, that, that many of the plans are prison like the ears. But uh, I, I think that uh, a lot of what we're talking about are school board issues in terms of.
think that was the deal. moves to adopt the the, the plans. Sorry. Questions? All in favor, let it be known by the most high. Aye. Aye. Let it be known by a raise of the right hand. All opposed? No to pass by the Senate. Next. Um, next item on your agenda. Consider a resolution. To recognize Native American Heritage Month. Uh, I that yes, sir, Ms. Chairman, if you don't mind, I'd like to stand in the podium. Please do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. So it's my honor to stand here at this podium tonight where I normally stand a little bit closer to you. I am a proud member of the Colossus Pony Tribe. We're primarily residing in a little community called Holliston, North Carolina, the southwest corner of Halifax County and Warren County. We are a little over 4,000 me uh, uh, members to our tribe. Uh, I believe I'm one of only two county managers, Native American county managers in the state, one of your few Native American employees here at Edgecombe County. So uh, it's my honor to stand here, not only because of that, but also because of the rich history that many people here in Edgecombe County don't realize that we have here in our great county. And so we want to recognize that tonight by this resolution, and I'll read it as you have it in your packet. Whereas the Edgecombe County Board of Commissioners acknowledges the rich and diverse history, cultural heritage that has shaped our county, and whereas North Carolina is home to a significant Native American population with historical roots that extend back millennia, and it boasts the largest Native American population east of the Mississippi. Whereas Edgecombe County is steeped in Native American history, and it was once heavily populated by multiple Native American tribes, the prominent, most prominent being the Tuscarora Nation. And whereas Native Americans have made and continue to make significant contributions to the social, economic, cultural, and political life of our state and nation, and whereas November has been designated nationally as Native American Heritage Month to recognize and celebrate the rich cultural traditions, contributions, and history of Native American peoples, and whereas it is essential to promote awareness and understanding of the unique heritage, traditions, and challenges faced by Native Americans throughout our nation and indigenous people all around the world. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Edgecombe County Board of Commissioners officially recognizes the, no, the month of November as Native American Heritage Month in Edgecombe County, North Carolina, this sixth day of November 2020. 
I do want to point out, and thank you for that so much, I do want to point out that um, uh, Reverend Higgs, this that you have at your place, he brought this to me. He's, he, he's very knowledgeable of the history of this county, including the history of Native people here in the county. So I just wanted to recognize him for uh, providing that. Moving on. Uh, item 8 is regarding uh, uh, Edgecombe Community College easement agreement. Uh, you see, the city of Rocky Mount is requesting a utility easement for property used by Edgecombe Community College at the Rocky Mount campus. The proposed easement is on a section of the campus which the county owns and leases for the biotech training center. The easement agreement and related maps are attached. I do want to note that the college has already approved this easement for the portion of the property that they own that this easement will cross. I recommend that you approve the enclosed easement agreement as presented. Motion. discussion with Nash County for some time regarding the sale of Edgecombe County's 45% interest in the former Edgecombe Nash Mental Health Building property located at 500 Nash Medical Arts Mall in Rocky Mount to Nash County. Nash County owns the remaining 55% of the property. We have come to a negotiated agreement for the sale of the county's interest in the property where Nash County is willing to pay $2.2 million for Edgecombe County's 45% interest in the property. Current tax value of the property is four million eight hundred and thirty-two thousand and seventy dollars. That's forty-five percent of the current tax value is two million one hundred seventy-four thousand four hundred and thirty-two dollars. County Attorney Michael Peters and I feel that two point two million is a reasonable and appropriate sales price considering the tax value of the property. Uh, our not having a need to own the property and the nature of the county's interest limits its value. For historical context, in 1991, Edgecombe County financed $945,000 for its portion of the construction of the building on this property. Therefore, I recommend that you approve the sale of our interest in the building located at 500 Nash Medical Arts Mall in Rocky Mountain to authorize Chairman Wiggins to execute the deed and related documents. Motion. regarding a request for the naming of the Tar River Bridge. Uh, I received a request from Dr. Glenda Knight on behalf of the Princeville Board of Commissioners requesting your support for the naming of the Tar River Bridge between Princeville and Tarboro in honor of the late Mr. Walter Fleming. A copy of the request is included. This request ultimately must be approved by the NC Transportation Board, but they ask for the support of the local governing body. If you would like to support the request, I will then work with Dr. Knight to submit the application. It must be first reviewed by NCDOT staff. If it meets their requirements, I will prepare a resolution for you to consider, which will accompany the application before the Transportation Board. If the Board chooses to support this request, I will notify the Town of Tarboro, so their Board will be aware this request is being submitted. is regarding a cell tower lease. Uh, as you were made aware at your last meeting, City Switch LLC is proposing to lease property from the county in order to construct and maintain a communications tower. The tower will be located next to the Kingsborough Water Tower. The proposed lease is for $850 per month for an, an initial term of 10 years with the option to renew for three additional five-year periods. The proposed tower does not meet the setback requirements of our Unified Development Ordinance. So City Switch LLC has applied to appear before our Board of Adjustments to get a variance. I recommend that you approve the lease agreement. Construction of the tower will be subject, subject to the approval of the variance from the Board of Adjustment. Uh, 
Uh, I, I do want to um, acknowledge that I believe we have representative uh, representatives here from Edgecombe Martin Electric Membership Corporation, and perhaps a, a representative from Kanban Logistics. Um, they are um, joining property owners, and I believe may want to speak uh, on this matter. Anybody? Please, please, please come forward. Come forward. We have a representative of the tower of the applicants here. Yes. Good. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Winston House, CEO at Edgecombe Martin EMC. <clears throat> what are the opportunity to speak in opposition of the tower that City Switch has proposed? Uh, a little history here, as Eric had already mentioned, uh, there was a proposal last year for them to locate the tower just south of the tracks next to the Kanban facility, and that was denied by the Planning and Adjustments Board because the offsets were not in place to, to meet the requirements at the time. Uh, the new proposed site puts it between uh, the county's water tower and our electric substation, which as you can imagine, is a critical piece of infrastructure uh, that we serve, uh, used to serve around 1,000 of our members in Edgecombe County. Uh, we serve approximately 12,000 12, members across Edgecombe Martin's system. Um, uh, the location that is proposed for the new tower will put it within 100 foot of major distribution lines coming out of our station. Uh, we serve several key accounts out of that station. If you remember, we served the QVC facility out of there we now uh, serve RQM investments out of there and several others that are looking to locate. Uh, of further importance is all the attention that we continue to get uh, from requests here in the county. Projects looking at the mega site, one of the top mega sites in the state, if not the country. And uh, there could be future expansion needs for that station. So we have grave concerns. Uh, safety and reliability are key to what we do. And we certainly want to make sure that we protect the interest of our members and that station. It's about a $12 million investment we have there, and we want to make sure that we can continue to provide safe and reliable power to our members. Uh, we understand that City Switch has stated that this tower is engineered to fall within its footprint if something were to happen. Um, we understand that and appreciate that, but in our line of work, we engineer and design a lot of things in our system, but they don't always work as they're engineered. Um, and that's just uh, how things happen sometimes. We also understand uh, the catastrophic uh, type of weather events that we experience here in our county. We're very familiar with the tornadoes that uh, we experienced here just a few months ago and the damage it caused. So uh, again, we have some, some very grave concerns about locating uh, almost a 300 foot tower that close to our substation and the risk that it can impose on our members and our infrastructure. And I certainly hope you will take that into consideration in approving a lease agreement when it doesn't even meet the setback requirements that the commission has already put in place. Good question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. with them, but I think based on the area that they're trying to serve, they have a fairly tight window where they want to locate the tower. Because we did, you know, we, we presented that, that to them as well. Mr. Evans, do you kind of have a tight window? Do they advise us that they get the request, who's supposed to get the request from a provider, and that provider gives them, we want the tower in this particular place. So I guess the house is their original application last year.
that's covered in trees right now. That's land that the county owns that they could potentially expand in that direction. So I say I put all of this on the table to weigh because, you know, I, I, uh, I'm not making this recommendation just because this company came and asked for it. We thought through all of these things. Certainly, I just want to clarify that position, my recommendation to you. Uh, certainly, I understand this is not an easy decision to make. Um, and, and have to support, we will support whatever decision that you have. May, may, may I ask a question? Yes, sir. I, I, this is the first I've heard of this time. What's the urgency on the cell phone? Well, this company wants to build it, and they, they, they build it as soon as they can. If they can get and why? Why, why, do, why they, if they just do that? Is there a demand for the service this tower is going to provide? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess we depend on market research that determines that and I think we do need sell tower additional towers in the area for reception in our area so um, uh, I would, you know we look at I look at uh, staff recommendations when they come and say they have done the best service as I do for you when you bring recommendations to the board sure. and I'm depending on what you say okay so my motion is to approve So now we've had our economic development excuse, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. My motion fails for lack of second. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, we've had a comment from our economic developer that he, he either wants to see more about it or needs to good night outright. And he has not been involved in the conversation. So we talked about the expansion of the MEG site, but we didn't involve our economic developer. He's not usually involved in what comes to his with a commissioner involved when he comes, he's not usually Item uh, attachment 13, item I, regarding uh, amendment to partner agreement between North Carolina Department of Public Safety. Uh, for time's sake, based on what, what's happening here, is you know, we have received money in the past, federal funds that run through the State Department of Public Instruction for a federal buyout program, letting properties eligible to be purchased. Once those properties are purchased and cleared, then the county takes ownership of that vacant lot and we have to maintain it as open space. We did that after Floyd, uh, Matthew, um, and so now the State Department of, um, uh, now the Office of Recovery and Resiliency has another buyout program, federal funds, but funded through another stream of federal funds, and they directly are administering the buyout light program and call it a buyout zone. So they've identified some areas in the county, part of town of Princeville, some outside of uh, town of Pine Top, a couple of smaller areas where people are eligible. It's a volunteer program. They can participate. What the state is asking us to do tonight is to amend that original cooperative agreement that we have with the state where we will then agree that any of those properties that they purchase, we will take ownership if it's in, in the unincorporated areas and maintain them as open space. Um, and so that's, uh, that's the amendment to the cooperative agreement. Uh, and you'll see there's, list, there's a listing of all of the properties that are eligible that are within those buyout zones. They might not all get bought out. They likely won't all be bought out. Um, but this will be an amendment to that agreement where we will accept those, uh, those properties. The second part of this is that resolution uh, to accept strategic buyout program properties. And what this will do is uh, by this, uh, by this uh, resolution, um, it will authorize me to then accept each of those properties as they are bought out, if they are bought out. So there, there will be deeds that will be signed to transfer to the county. So that will authorize me to accept those properties that are bought out. So um, first recommendation is to approve the First Amendment to the Parker Agreement with the North Carolina Department of Public Safety. Questions? 
second part of that is to approve the resolution to accept strategic buyout program contracts. Next is regarding our compensation plan. And, um, as we've continued to review our new compensation plan, we've identified additional corrections and additions to be made. Attached is a summary of those changes which, which present no additional appropriation needed to the budget. I recommend that you approve the updated compensation plan ordinance as, uh, as presented. Um, policy update. Uh, basically, uh, in the policy that you all approved back in 2019, uh, it specifically says that a, a public records request must be submitted on a form that we provide as part of our new, uh, relatively new policy. What happens is sometimes you will have an entity that may say email uh, Mr. Peters or um, Ms. Lewis requesting information that's publicly available. But because our policy says that it has to be, that request has to be on that form, then they have to send it to them and say, take all of the information and put it on this form. And that's a duplicated effort. It's not necessary. As long as they have the information that we need and require for that public records request, um, uh, we feel it would be fine to not have to use uh, that policy, uh, not have to use that form. And so you'll see that um, that uh, in the recommended change to the policy, you'll see on pages 9 and 10, it removes a requirement that the request be on our form. Also on page 11, additional information is provided to specify the fee we charge for processing extraordinarily large requests. On page 14, a formatting issue is correct. I recommend that you approve as presented. I want to acknowledge uh, Ms. Teresa Lewis for uh, for her uh, going through the document and making those recommendations. Motion. Next is regarding your schedule of values for the 2024 revaluation. As you know, at your last meeting, you held a, a public hearing and, and presented was a schedule of values to be used for the 2024 um, revaluation. Um, what we need tonight is uh, two separate actions. Um, we recommend first that you take action to approve the market value um, as presented at the uh, October meeting. The second motion then will be to uh, to approve the present use value that was as previously presented. First motion will be to approve the market value uh, schedule as presented. Motion. Second. Second motion will be to approve the uh, schedule of values for present use value as presented. Motion. Second. Retiring soon, as you know, state statute allows the board to award the retiring officer his or her service with. It specifically states that you may do so at a price determined by you as the governing body. Sheriff Atkinson has requested consideration be given for retiring Captain Charles West to Sergeant David Parker. To show the county's appreciation for their exemplary service and to provide a memento to that service, I recommend that you approve the transfer their service weapons at a price of one dollar upon the retirement of Captain Charles <coughs> West and Sergeant. <coughs>
Thanks so regarding um, a grant that uh, park extensions uh, we received from NC State. Um, we've received notice that NC State is uh, through the Ag, Ag, Ag Ventures Program um, is approving $4,967 for the purchase of an enclosed trailer. Um, this does require a 15% match, but that will be covered by funds uh, already appropriated that Carper Extension already has, so no additional appropriation is needed. Uh, I'm recommending to approve the <coughs> project ordinance as approved. Motion. 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 Questions? All in favor of it on both sides. Aye. 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 All opposed? Carrying out and approved. Next is appointments. We have uh, appointments to our Park and Recreation Advisory Board. Thompson the fourth, and he's eligible for reappointment. Is there a motion? Okay. Question. All in favor, let it be known by both sides. Aye. Aye. All opposed, hearing none, he's reappointed. After this, and the leases for the view on approval, Mr. Evans, is anything we brought to our attention? No, sir. Happy to answer your question. Is there a motion to approve? Motion. Second. Questions. All in favor, let it be known by both sides. Aye. Aye. All opposed, hearing none, it is approved. Our contracts for the view on approval. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, I do need you to take separate action on a couple of these tonight. So first, you have a change order to an existing contract with Envirocon. Uh, this will be to uh, add, uh, and this company provides security, key fob access in our building. This will be add to add access and security controls at our emergency operations center. Uh, no additional budget appropriation is needed, but we recommend that you separately approve um, that change order. Yes, sir. The second one. The second one is um, Prime Corrections. Uh, this is a not to exceed a contract, not to exceed two hundred thousand dollars. Note that this is paid through savings found in medical billing for jail health services. Um, this uh, company the services cost containment services for medical services at the detention center. Um, Captain Oliver Washington, who's uh, shared jail administrator is here tonight. Uh, he may be able to share a little bit more about uh, this company and um, what they provide. Um, I do, if you do approve this, I recommend part of your approval be as a sole source uh, benefit. <laughs> Sometimes you talk yourself out of it. Exactly. All in favor, let it know by both sides. Aye. All opposed. You're not going to go through. Sometimes people do talk themselves out of it. Okay. So, uh, and, and then the last one is with Avinian. Um, this is a company that provides GIS addressing software. This also is a request for sole source contract. This vendor provides an addressing solution that is the most compatible with our GIS system, which is why we recommend this sole source, $3,750. Motion? Second. Question. All in favor, let it be known by both sides. Aye. Aye. All opposed? Yeah, none of this is approved. Um, it's all contracts. That's all contracts. Uh, the department of Reports, uh, Wallace. 
It was so targeted, and we knew all of those addresses. Mm -hmm. We let them know directly. Okay, now, the board made a motion to end the state of emergency. Yes. A motion to end the state of emergency. Mm -hmm. Second. Questions? All in favor, let it be known by the vote sign aye. Aye. All opposed, hearing none, the state of emergency is now in. Mr. Chairman, I say on October 31st, you met with a sheriff and town manager of Tarboro mm -hmm. in regards to the uh, animal shelter. Uh, still no. <coughs> Lewis offer any uh, words of uh, dollar figures to you in regards to support for that? No, sir. He, he, he did express that the town is still interested in participating, okay. still defining what that might look like. Uh, he's going to go back. Um, I shared with him our estimate right now for where we are is uh, $4 million, uh, 775000 that we already have in hand from last year's state appropriation we can use for that. I mentioned to you before recommending that we use a million dollars of proceeds from the sale of this building to go towards that and the balance of that to borrow from USDA Rural Development's Community Facilities Program. That's probably likely the best terms that we can get. Yes, so share all of that with them, with Mr. Lewis. He's going to go back and discuss with his board. Okay. Thank see you. Where they Thank you. Uh, next step for us, though, is um, for uh, Mr. Matthews and uh, Stan, our, our maintenance director, and Chief Deputy Williams and other staff members who was the whole committee that was involved. Um, they just recently made a few more last tweaks to the plan, the, the building plan. And so now we're going to have the architect to draw up the, the bid documents so that we can go ahead and bid that out. Our goal is to try to bid that out before the end of December so we can get some hard and fast bid numbers. We will have to have that anyway for uh, USDA.
we've been keeping the um, our animal welfare advisory council updated on where we are with that as well. Should Tarboro vote? Last thing on the manager's report, I don't have it listed, but I do want to point out, as mentioned earlier, you have a copy of a letter at your place. We were recently notified that East Point, uh, Trillium, and Sand Hills uh, managed care organization or MCO uh, areas are going to merge. It looks like that this is a word from the um, Secretary of Department of Health and Human Services um, that their the plan is to consolidate those those three areas. There's still you know, some, some work to be done. That's different, as you know, that's different from what we had heard before. What we had last heard, there was a plan uh, for East Point to merge with Sand Hills region. Uh, and now that, that will now include uh, Trillium. I've uh, been told the expectation is that uh, uh, East Point is gonna be the lead entity in, in, in that. Um, but you know there, there's there's a lot to be done. And I guess we just we'll, we'll wait and see how that how that um, how that pans out. So that, that's all I have for the manager. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank Mr. Wiggins for resolution. her on Saturday, which was her official birthday, we found out in Halifax County. We had been celebrating in October. But we finally got a copy of her birth certificate, so November 4th, 1990. But anyway, I mean, four years we were over there. So thank you for your consideration and for being there for us. It's really surprising to me. I really appreciate it. Any other commissioners? Just one comment. Um, medical grades came out today for hospitals throughout the state and glad I'm receiving an A for patient safety, which is a great success. Um, we're very lucky to have that facility here in Michigan County and they do a lot of great work for us, which is just a little recognition that we have. Mr. Thorne has a birth child, is that right? Happy, happy, happy healthy boy and mama. What? Huh?